when uh, when Ruth called to ask if I would do this, Judy answered the phone. And when I heard who it was, and I heard Judy mention the Unitarians, I yelled to Judy, can I come with you? <laughs> uh, and that's, I mean, she's usually the one. When I was in practice, I did a lot of talking. In fact, that's the first time Judy ever saw me when I was giving a lecture about alcoholism. Uh, now we do a lot of research about all of at the end of the month. By the way, I also thought, should I or should I not wear my Superman shirt? I mean, I wear Superman shirts all the time, but, well, no, fairly formal. And maybe I shouldn't today. So um, I put it on uh, because uh, it's going to ultimately be part of my talk because I believe that there are two purposes to retirement. And the first one, the more important one, I'll talk about later, but the second one is, is, is to be as eccentric as you can possibly be. So I usually wear these a lot. It also helps me dealing with old age. Um, my background, as Ruth mentioned, is uh, all in New York City. I went to Stuyvesant High School, which uh, I don't know if you were aware of. But the public education system in New York is fantastic. They have a number of special high schools that you have to take a test to get in. Judy went to music and art. Um, I went to Stuyvesant, and it's a really good, good school. I had my bachelor's from Columbia, my MD from Cornell. I interned at Parkland Memorial Hospital uh, one year after JFK died there. I had my psych residency at the University of Colorado Medical Center. Uh, then two years in the Army at Aberdeen Proving Ground um, as a psychiatrist in the Army to pay the Army back for not having pulled back my training during Vietnam. Uh, it was kind of a catch-22. Uh, the residencies wanted guarantees that they weren't to lose their residence, and the Army was looking for people to practice their specialties, so that's what happened. Um, from 1968 to 95, I was in psychiatric practice in Denver, during which I was considered the expert in, uh, on alcohol and drug abuse. Um, I was the first psychiatrist ever accepted uh, by the uh, alcoholism treatment community because at the time there was a lot of animosity by that community towards psychiatry because of the mistreatment uh, that many alcoholics had received at the hands of, uh, of psychiatrists, um, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy being one of them. Um, Ruth did ask if I talk about my journey, about how I got from psychiatrist to Potter. Um, and uh, because I now see my journey in retrospect, I probably will sound a lot more intelligent than I should than I <laughs> will because it's in retrospect. It's Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, at the time, uh, I took pottery lessons to maintain my sanity because the first year of retirement was really kind of rough. I had confused what I did for a living um, with who I was as a person. And I think that's fairly generalizable. So I took pottery lessons uh, from uh, um, uh, Howie. Um, who used to be a member of this congregation. And uh, after a while, I started driving him crazy because if he'd go on vacation, I still wanted to use his pottery studio when he was pronounced out of practice. So with the proviso that I will appear more intelligent than in fact I was at the time, um, I arrived here full time with Judy on July 3rd of 95, moved into what had been our vacation home. Um, this last Thursday is then 19 years since we've been here, and in that time, I don't know about you, but I've become an old time here. <coughs> um, as I said, the first year was a tough year because I confused my, my professional persona with who I am. So, with Howie Shapiro, I started the pottery lessons uh, just to get busy and get out of the house, and there was something, and I don't know if I want to be grandiose and say godlike, um, or um, I don't know, um, kind of manic, about <laughs> taking a lump of clay and having a picture in my head about what I wanted to do and to make it with my hands. And that was magic. 
and I just fell in love with it. I began to practice more and more, as I said, at Howie's studio between my lessons. Um, in fact, I loved making pottery so much that I called my niece Michelle. Michelle's my oldest niece. She's 14 years younger than me. My, uh, my brother's, I have, I have an older brother, uh, my brother's oldest daughter. To tell her that the left side of my brain wasn't a vestigial organ after all. <laughs> she reminded me that prior to medical school, I used to draw all the time. I never took a drawing lesson, but I used to draw. And my big brother, her father, what's the purpose of the big brother except to dump on his younger brother, <laughs> would say, yeah, when Mike draws a horse, you don't think it's a cow. <laughs> it was it was there was a compliment. No, it was about as left handed as you can get. Kind of like the time he saw how much exercise I was always doing and told me that I would be the uh, the oldest vegetable in the nursing home. So <laughs> anyway, my work is now in seven galleries up and down the coast, plus uh, uh, plus one of them in Eugene. Um, and I've looked back at the last 19 years, and I've come up with the following. I think that at birth, as human beings, we are all um, multi-potential. We have more potentials undeveloped than we really are aware of. And I envision that as being like a rectangle. Because when I start thinking about professional training, I think that the definition of a professional, whether they are a psychiatrist, um, or a lawyer, or an engineer, uh, any professional. I think the process of becoming a professional is learning more and more about less and less. And so when I thought about that, I thought of a triangle, because I learned more and more about less and less, and in the process I locked off so many of the multi-potentials that I had um, without even remembering them. And it was uh, my niece who reminded me of that, her comment. Um, and we decide, as we're learning more and more about less and less, we, we, we keep making decisions that are based upon practicality. You know, I can't make a living at that kind of stuff, so I'll do this so that I can support myself. <coughs> well, I think, as I was referring to before, retirement has two purposes. One is to reinvent yourself. Um, I firmly believe that if you sit around waiting to die, that's exactly what's going to happen. And um, <coughs> I'm one of the physicians who never played golf in his life and thought it was kind of a silly game. Um, I didn't ever picture that retirement could be a permanent vacation. And the second one I already mentioned. People ask me, um, how many Superman t-shirts do I have? And I, I can't tell them. <laughs> I really don't know. I know that my, my kids, if they can't figure out what to get me for my birthday, um, know to get me a superhero shirt of some kind. In fact, I have to tell a story on this Howie, because Howie gave me a Superman t-shirt a couple of years ago, which is so outrageous, I'm embarrassed. Even I am embarrassed. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I, it sits in my drawer, and I, rem it, I remind it all of what it is. It's this black shirt with all sorts of bling. And yes, it has the super, but the, the Superman logo is kind of made up of diamonds and uh, chains, diamonds, <laughs> gold chains. So I wear it very rarely, Howard, but I, <laughs> but I, I couldn't bring myself to do it today. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. Well, so as I thought about. You know, I used to work up at Earthworks Gallery in Yaha's, and every so often I would run into somebody uh, who was about to enter retirement, who was early in their retirement. And one of the things that I really loved about working in an art gallery was chatting up people. And fortunately, it would sell art, but it was fun to chat a lot. And so sometimes we would get to that, and I would suggest to people, uh, to make a list of things that they enjoyed during the course of their life that they dropped because they weren't practical. The so-called to be happening with forks in the road that we all come to make decisions. Look at the things you gave up, the things that uh, you gave up, uh, that gave you joy rather, but that you didn't think you would be making much of a living with. Well, for those things, make up a list and then you go for it. One of the great things about a small town 
is that you can be a big fish in a small pond. And I'll share something with you, but if you let it out of this room, I'll have to kill you all. <laughs> it's not hard to come to a place like Florence and to announce I am Florence. It's, it's just not. Um, in fact, it took me a while to make that statement without laughing. <laughs> uh, a number of years ago, um, before the, the River Gallery opened, I got a call from Jan, who, who owns it. And um, she, t uh, I got this call, and she said, uh, is this Mike Schwartz, the artist? And I did start laughing. Uh, at which point, I contained myself as best I could. And then she explained to me that um, she was moving out from Medford. She had seen my work uh, in the uh, case in the lobby of the library. Um, and would I like to be in her gallery? So I did that. I was, in fact, I was, I was the first artist in that gallery. Um, and that, I haven't laughed about saying I'm an artist ever since, but that, that was it. Um, let me show you an example of what I do. And um, then, um, you know, whatever questions, or I'll be around afterwards. By the way, in, uh, in synagogue, we refer to what you do afterwards as an owner. And people get together and shoes and have coffee and whatever. So, I have to get this out without breaking the neck. No, no, thank you. It's just a matter of figuring out where the base of the pot is because the neck is very slender and very fragile. And if I pick it up by the neck, I may wind up with just having the neck in my hand. And it's fun. Um, the pot is treated with salts and metals. Um, um, and the, when it was when it was damp, uh, I would burnish it with polished stone. So it gets very smooth and shiny. Then when it's dry, I fire the first time in my kiln to about maybe 1400 degrees um, uh, over the course of 11 to 12 hours. It becomes what pot is called bisque. It's still porous. Then I treat the pot with salts and metals, wrap it in three layers of aluminum foil, buried in wood shavings, um, scrap wood that I have to that I get from wherever I see a house being built and have to promise the contractor that I know not to take anything that's about 18 inches or above because that's the distance of the studs in the wall. Um, set the whole thing on fire, uh, wait for it to cool off so that the next day is a cross between archaeology and gifts. Um, wash off the ash, you know, remove the foil, wash the ash off, um, and then let it dry. Uh, and because it's Still, it's smooth. It's no longer shiny from the burnishing. It's basically the pits of hell and fire. Um, but then I wax it to bring back the, uh, the sheen. Uh, the wax that I use is Kiwi Neutral Shoe Polish. I, I think that one I kind of invented because I, I um, tried to think of what kind of a wax would not scuff too much. Shoe polish just makes <laughs> sense. So, any, any questions? Yeah. Are you giving any lessons to reach semi-retired or retired people? I would love to give lessons. It's not happened. Um, you know, I haven't been advertising to do that. The one drawback, yes, I only have I, my studio is small. It's not it's not my whole double garage. It's half my double garage, and um, I have one wheel, so I can demonstrate and then have, you know and, and go from there. Most potters who, who give lessons um, uh, usually have two or three or four wheels. So if they can demonstrate, people can follow them along at the same time. But I'll be happy to give you my card if you want to call me sometime to talk further about it. Yeah? Yeah, I was interested when you say firing it up. Mm -hmm. uh, way back in Indonesia, they make pottery from red clay, mm -hmm. and they use uh, charcoal to fire it. But they fire it only for a certain time, so it stays porous. Yes, because, because they put water on it, it kind of cools it. Uh, kind of well, this is this is porous, and it has to be because the fumes that are generated in the fire have to get into the clay. If they were just on on top of the clay, it would you know get it wet once and they're off. 
<laughs> so this is still it is still porous. It's a, it's it's a um, decorative piece. Um, uh, if you put water in it, it's not it's not going to be ruined. It'll sweat, so you just let it dry and get yourself some more kiwi, which you should polish. <laughs> um, uh, I I a long time ago there are two cate general categories of wheel throwing pots. One is uh, decorative, and the other is, is called functional things that we all need out of. Functional pieces have no pores. They're fired at a much higher temperature, and the pores close. Um, one day I was talking to one of the customers who came into the gallery where I work, and uh, some, she heard the apology in my voice when I said, well, my pieces aren't functional, they're, they're decorative. And this marvelous woman put her hands on her hips and said, who said that pleasing the eye and the spirit wasn't function? <laughs> I almost kissed her. <laughs> and then I proceeded to steal her sentence and put it in my artist statement. <laughs> wow. Yes. How, how long did it take you to create that before firing? Well, it's it's hard to answer because if I want to get a, a, a kiln load for the, that first firing. And I certainly don't want to use 220 volts of electricity for each pot. I, I, you know, I want to fill my kiln. So, and, uh, so I throw it on one day, just to talk about the one pot, I'll throw it on one day. If it's at this time of year, I wait two days. If it's during the rainy season, I wait three to four days, and then I trim it. Because the bottom of a thrown piece tends to be thick. Because if you can picture throwing wet clay, it's, you have a battle between the wet clay and gravity. So these walls have to be thicker. So when I first threw this, you know, it was probably about out to there. And so you wait until it gets leather hard, and then I trim it, I trim it down. And I picture what the form it, it was inside. But, so I trim it, and I, I use something I learned in medical school. Here's the crossover. Um, when a doctor examines your chest and they do this kind of thing, prior to technology, of course, they do this kind of thing. And you can do it, you can even hear it. And this starts vibrating. And so I, I do the same thing on the pot as I'm, as I'm trimming it. And when I hear the vibration, I know that the wall is thin enough. Yeah. Because if I go beyond that, I'm going to cut right through it. And it's, and it's blind. I mean, I, I obviously can't put my fingers on both sides. So I can't, so, uh, and then the, the firing itself, at the, the uh, kiln firing is, as I said, 11 to 12 hours. And then the pit fire uh, firing is probably about, is about two to three hours, but then I have to wait for it to cool. Uh, and then I have to wait a couple of days after I wash it to, to, for it to dry, and then I sit there. And it, it's, uh, well, all art is labor intensive. You know? And the pit all firing, do, do you do that in groups or individually? I do it by myself in the backyard. I used well, to do it in the ground. I need more than one piece at a time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The whole kill load. Uh, I used to do it in the ground, and then as age got along, and I had back surgery in about 2001, I had to figure out what to do, so I brought the pit above ground, and I used 55 gallon drums instead. But it's the same process. Yes? So as a psychiatrist, did you analyze this transition went through it? Is it worth writing a book about it for the help of other people? <coughs> I don't know if I have enough to write a book about. Maybe I could write an article about it, but I don't think I have enough. For a book. I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have the patience to write it. <laughs> Did you analyze the process as a scientist? Well, uh, no, no. I, I, I'll share something with you about being a psychiatrist. People have said to Judy, "How can you be married to a psychiatrist?" That's crazy. If you want, if, if you want, I. I I, I haven't been successful in a lot of marriage. I, I just haven't. And um, if you want to be successful in a marriage, you don't try to psychologize your partner. Just don't do that. Um, I can tell you that people who hear I've been a psychiatrist, and some of them, you can almost see them jumping two steps back. Mm -hmm. and, I, and as a psychiatrist, I still have my psychiatric opinion. I do. Um, but as a psychiatrist, I would have my psychiatric opinion out, and I would see how I was reacting about something, and then I would use my reaction to focus on what was I responding to in the patient, and use that in the therapy. Now, when my psychiatric antennae start going like that, I just decide I want nothing to do with that person. <laughs> 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 when you uh, 
if you make a mistake, no. um, do you have a way of dealing with that mentally so that <laughs> it doesn't drive Yeah, you? I, I remind myself that if I make a mistake, it's just mud. It's not like dealing with human beings at all. <laughs> and, and you reclaim the clay. I mean, when I trim, I don't throw the trimmings away. They're put in water, and then I reclaim them. Um, and about, I can make, given how much clay I will take off a pot, roughly, I can use the clay that I've taken off from a pot, from three pots, to make another one like that. Mm -hmm. So why would I want to throw away a third, you know, third? So you don't feel bad about destroying that piece? No. Uh, if it breaks in the, in the pit, yeah, it bothers me a little bit. But, you know, the, 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 um, I stole the phrase, it's only mud from Howie Shapiro. <laughs> see, I, see, I don't think there's anything really new. I think all uh, we do is learn how to plagiarize better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How do you control the color that you want to achieve? Well, yes and no. I, I don't have one that I put medals on, because uh, I, I put up a show um, in the uh, lobby of the library for this month. So I don't have a lot left in the house right now, so I couldn't bring one that I have medals on. But the nice thing is that most of my pieces are a combination of the variability of the fire, and I know, for example, I use a little uh, copper ribbon, and I'll get a sharp black line from copper ribbon. If I use the uh, copper mesh from, uh, uh, well, the scrubbies, you know, if, if the dishwasher breaks down and you're doing it by hand, um, I, I'll get a kind of a, a copper uh, black mesh design. Um, steel wool will give me a reddish brown. Um, so that kind of stuff is predictable, and certainly I know that this color, which is a combination coming from copper carbonate and um, 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 etching, which is a solution of uh, ferric chloride and hydrochloric acid, for that one I need to wear rubber gloves. I know what the color will be, but I don't know exactly what the pattern will be. So the, the metals are much more predictable. I know kind of what the colors are going to be. So it's a combination of something planned and something unplanned. Mm -hmm. And that satisfies both the left and right side of the so each, each pot is unique, like each yes. person? It, very, yes, it is. It, 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 it's always one of a kind. Um, in fact, the theme of my show that I, in the library is, um, uh, I forget exactly how I put it, but, um, um, but it's a reference to that I have, I have multiple examples of the same form. But because each form is thrown individually, there are some differences. And I can fire pots with different salts and whatever. So it's, yeah, the, the, the theme is the same but different. Gesundheit. Thank you. And, and so, yeah, so, um, uh, well, <laughs> any other questions? Thanks. No. Yeah. Well, you can. Uh, sometimes it's happened, but more often than not, I'll have a picture in my head. And that's what gives me pleasure, being able to do it. Um, there have been some times uh, when I've been throwing a tall slender pot and it's got really sloppy and I'll turn it into a play with a <laughs> But not often. Uh, the thing that gives me pleasure is to go from thinking it to moving.